Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Coach Jonathan Stokey on. Jonathan, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, man. So I have seen your name around for a while. Um, obviously, your Instagram channel has kind of taken off and, and done really well. And then this year at TennisCon 7, uh, where I presented, you were also presenting, and I was able to check out your uh, your presentation there on reading the serve location. Um, I don't know if what the exact title was, um, but I really loved the way you presented that. So I wanted to lead with that and tell us how, how do we read the serve location? God, you're going to put me on the spot so I can remember my presentation <laughs> from like four months ago. Um, you know, I broke it down just like a couple things, right? So you can have uh, like a technical, you know, cue. So there are some people who are just unable to serve in certain locations. And I think at the amateur level, basically, when someone comes up and they don't have a continental grip, and they've got mm -hmm. like a little more of like the pancake grip or whatever you want to call that, they're facing the court. I'm typically not worried about their slice serve out wide. And even if they can hit it, it's probably not that quality. So it's not something I really have to respect. So mm -hmm. you can look at a technical cue like that and kind of go, man, they probably serve a little flatter, which means body or T in the deuce, and then probably body or wide in the ad. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are things like that. We went through some, um, you know, pattern stuff. We're just thinking like, where does someone usually start a match serving? If you don't know me as a, as an opponent, what mm -hmm. serve do you start with? I would guess that 90% start with their favorite serve. Mm -hmm. So I just go, oh, okay, you served out wide to start the match. That's a, I'm guessing you didn't show up and start with your worst serve. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's like a very simple way for me. The same concept applies to the first important point. So, mm -hmm. hey, the first no ad or the first break point. Okay, you served me out wide in the ad court. That's also a great indicator of what you normally like to do. Mm. Um, so we just kind of went through things like that. And of course, nothing is 100%, but there's, you know, there were probably two or three technical, two or three uh, pattern-based things, and then just kind of reading the situation as well. And when you factor all those things together, I found that there were a lot of times where I kind of knew where the ball was going. I didn't really feel like I was reacting. Mm -hmm. I kind of had an idea, hey, Will started off the match serving. <clears throat> Will started off the match serving wide. He served me wide three times in a row and it worked well for him. Here comes a deuce point. What, what do we think is coming here? I don't really yeah. have to react to both things. I can go, I'm sitting on the wide, you know? Yeah. And um, So yeah, that was a fun one. It's a simple one. I like kind of that mindset, the chess match that you play with people, but um, you definitely should not be returning serve and kind of going like, hey, anything can happen. Cause I think very rarely is that the situation. Yeah. Yeah, as the more I've coached on court and gotten more deeper and deeper into double strategy, uh, I feel like every six to 12 months, there's like a new thing that I'm preaching. And the last six months is adjusting your return position based on the server. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm seeing a lot of players return from the same position on first and second serve. And a lot of people have these like real weak kind of lollipop second serves and the returner ends up sprinting forward and catching it like down at their ankles or at their knees and they're really not balanced and uh you know I, so I, i'm telling people to shift forward for that second serve if it's that type of serve but i like that tip on the the pancake grip so like if you're in the deuce court they probably don't have that slice serve so just shift to the left you know and make them beat you on the slice serve Exactly. Um, it's, cover it's, cover what they're comfortable with and allow them to try something they're clearly probably not great at. And if you've already mm -hmm. got someone trying their weaker serve, like you're you're already yeah. on the right track. Like you haven't hit a ball and you already got them playing with their left hand. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. And that's that's something that that even works at the pro level. There was a match at Indian Wells um several years ago where um I was working with a player and told her she was in the ad court and I said on big points, your opponent here loves the T serve. So you can either start in your normal position and then start to shift as the toss goes up, or you can just shift to the right and show her, I know you're about to hit this. And that's the one she did. And the girl ultimately tried to go wide. She missed the serve. And then you get more second serve looks. So there's 
both ways you can kind of handle that. You you can shift or you can start there. So, so for me, like I had a great backhand return. Mm -hmm. So if I knew someone was going to serve tea against me and I'm right-handed in the deuce, I would not cheat over because I want, okay. like, if I know it's going to my backhand, I'm going to rope it back. So I was okay with that. <laughs> if I knew they were going to serve to my forehand, which was weaker, then I would slide over big time because I either want to be there and make it easier, or I'm really hoping I can convince them to serve to mm -hmm. my stronger side. Yeah. So you, you can definitely do both, but um, yeah, mixing up your return position based on what's going on is huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to, uh, to, to make that adjustment. I like that a lot. Um, so scrolling through some of your Instagram videos, we're going to go through a few of these, um, oh God. Okay. kind of throughout the conversation. Uh, so there was one on high percentage tennis and I really liked it a lot because it, it kind of clarified some things for me, um, that I see all the time in club level double. So I'll see these teams. It happened just last week. I was on the court with this, uh, three old ladies, t uh, team and this girl like moved to the middle uh, hit a volley. It was a good volley. Then the opponent passed her down the line. And then she looks to her partner and says, my bad. And I went over to her and I said, you did everything right there. What, what was your bad? Like, tell me what you did wrong. Um, but your high percentage tennis video kind of reminded me of that. Talk about that video and what high percentage tennis means to you. Yeah. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll add a bonus at the end. So don't, don't let me forget, but Okay. Yeah, high percentage tennis. So uh, let's say, you know, Craig O'Shaughnessy is famous, you know, hey, you come to the net, you're winning probably 60% of the points, whether you're a good volley or not. Coming to the mm -hmm. net is a is a great high percentage play. If you do that 100 times, that means you lose 40. Okay, number one, you have to accept that. And those 40 points that you lose, usually don't feel great. Mm -hmm. So you either got passed, you missed your approach, you hit a volley you didn't love. Either way, you're leaving unhappy 40 times. And also, by the way, the 60 that you win don't always feel great either. So mm -hmm. sometimes you came in and your approach felt bad and they missed an easy passing shot and you go, see, that won't work next time. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, that's also a rough way to look at it. So in that video, number one, I, I made sure that people know that a high percentage play does not mean it works 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So I know where Will is serving. I have a good idea. That didn't work for me 100% of the time. Sometimes you're going to ace me to the side I wasn't expecting. That's okay. I'm comfortable. I don't expect to be 100%. So that's number mm -hmm. one. Number two is high percentage does not mean that you're going to win more than half your points. So if you're in trouble, um, I'll give an example, a doubles example, since we're on the doubles podcast. I am a firm believer that most people, amateur, when they volley at the net, they volley cross court. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you had a sitter forehand volley on the net against me, I would start running for the angle right away, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean it happens all the time. And by the way, if you have a sitter volley, I'm probably not going to win a ton of those points. I'm just trying to give myself the best chance in a tough situation, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense. So it does. I think with the high percentages, people think, oh, that's supposed to work all the time and a lot. And that's not necessarily it. I also think one problem is when people like the woman you said who pinched middle and, and mm -hmm. did everything correctly, but got beat line. Okay. Mm -hmm. She is comparing that one example of I poached and got beat line. And in her mind, she's comparing it to this made up scenario, but it's the best case scenario of the other tactic. So she's going, well, if I had stayed, they either would have hit to me and I would have hit a volley winner or they would have hit to my partner and we would have been fine and won the point. Mm -hmm. Except we all know that when you stay, you don't win all your points. So you're comparing mm -hmm. the worst outcome of one tactic to the best outcome of the opposite tactic, which is a horrible way to decide if you're doing something correctly. You're comparing mm -hmm. one to one and you're making up one situation. So um, yeah, I just find that's a big misconception. My kids all the time at clinic will do the right thing and lose the point. And mm -hmm. as a total math guy, I'm like, yeah, that's totally understandable. And they have a very hard time processing that and then mm -hmm. sticking to that positive tactic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of people just don't realize. And that's what uh, I've had Craig on the podcast before. And he, he's kind of helped me understand this, like just how small the margins are in tennis. 
because everybody's always talked about it. But then when he was able to start to put some data behind it and say, you know, Djokovic wins 55% of his points, it's like, that means if he's playing a game to 11, he wins 11, nine. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's very close. Like he won that 11 right. pointer by two. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy how small these margins are, but if you do trust the percentages, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you mentioned a, a bonus. Yeah, well, I, I just find it interesting how how often think people think they are the exception. Mm. So so O'Shaughnessy will show girls' 12s when they come in. They win whatever it is, high 50% and low 60. And college guys mm. will win mid-60s. And pros are about the same. Mm -hmm. But Stokey, you don't understand. I'm the one guy that that doesn't apply to, <laughs> right? But but right. that's everybody I coach because you don't understand. I don't volley well or I don't know what I'm doing up there. And I'm like, hey, by the yeah. way, everyone – not many people I watch know what they're doing up there yeah. and they still win. Think about how good a tactic it is that you don't volley well, and you might not even know what to cover and you're still winning 60%. So yeah, if people are out there listening and like, yeah, that sounds good or covering middle sounds good, but you don't understand about me. <laughs> there's probably everyone listening who thinks that, and there's a good chance that you are not the exception. You are in that majority. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And even, um, on some of those like covering middle with the volleys uh one of the weird lessons i think it's in my like welcome email sequence or something is i tell people you need to be shanking more volley winners um and the reason for that is is just to improve your court position and it's like if you're you're closer to the net you're closer to the middle you're ultimately going to end up shanking some volley winners and like that's a good thing that means you're you're moving to the right position and obviously you know improve your volleys hit the strings when you can but it's okay to hit it off the frame every now and then. And, and I'm not even sure you need to always apologize for it if you're doing the right things. Right. So, I love that. I, I just had Rajiv. Um, I'm actually going to release this episode uh, in three days on Monday. I don't know when you release this one, but we were talking about why does he get so close to the net? And mm -hmm. he said, for obviously that reason, it's easier to angle balls off. You can get lucky with some shanks. Um, but he was like, you know, even though the guys return so well, you would think that backing up, gives you more time but mm -hmm. he said when he backs up he feels like he gets beat up even more he's mm -hmm. like the return is still good and now i can't finish a volley mm -hmm. so even though he might take an extra five feet to see the ball he's like now what do i do with it he's like i just feel like i get crushed i'd rather mm -hmm. be on top of the net i can just deflect little angles i can get lucky yeah and it's really not that like it's not like he's testing his reflexes that much more by being a yard closer or five feet closer. So I loved yeah. how he explained that, but it, yeah, getting close to that shank and volley winners. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It would t take away his angles a bit. It allow the ball to drop a little more. And then also the, the baseline players are not going to feel as much pressure because out of their peripherals, they're seeing how close you are to the net. Absolutely. Um, so they may, may be a little less likely to make an error. Um, so I want to get more into strategy, but let's uh, take a step back and just tell us your tennis story. I know you played uh, college tennis at Duke, coached a while, um, but how did you get started to kind of where you are now? So I moved to Chapel Hill when I was 10. I think that was, uh, yeah, eight or 10, but I started playing tennis in North Carolina when I was 10 years old and I was all sport athlete. So I actually grew up, I had two backhands. I held it like a baseball bat. So I had the right hand on okay. top for a forehand. And the left hand out, I would switch. Okay. I'm trying, I'm would, doing that right now to try oh, to man, feel, I mean, feel God, like what that's like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't get worse technique to start, but I would, I was an athlete and a competitor. So it was like, okay, I like this. What do I do? Someone said, enter a tournament. Cool. I'll enter one in 10 days. And I went there and it was just like slicing balls in play, running balls down. Intuitively, I kind of understood, oh, if you make balls, you can't lose. Like it's yeah. tough to hit a winner. So I did well. And then I fell in love with it. And my technique was always a little rough, but I got pretty good quickly. And then my doubles big break, I kind of came to the net a lot. I'd serve and volley a little bit, even when I was in the 14s. At 14s Orange Bowl, Rajiv Ram was playing doubles with Brian Baker. And Brian's mm -hmm. a year behind me and Rajiv. He was a first year 14. Rajiv and I were second year 14s. And Brian was going to stay down an age group. And so Rajiv was watching me like serve and volley at Orange Bowl. I got a couple good wins. And he's like, dude, you want to just try playing doubles at Easter Bowl next year? Cause like I don't have a partner. And I'm like, Yeah, I I would actually. That'd be great. I do. <laughs> yeah. And so we got there and we lost in the finals. I want to say to Steven Armitage, Sam Warburg. The loss is 
always stick with you. But we had a good tournament. So he's like, hey, how about we play clay courts? We went to clay courts. We won clays. And then it was like, okay, we'll just play everything from here on out. And that was my big break as a doubles player. Having a partner like that, we could go to all the big events. We did really well. Um, from there, went to Duke. Uh, you know, we were always a, a top eight team, played singles, doubles, became a doubles All American. That was an awesome experience. Got to play a lot of big matches. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I look back and my fondest memory is competing with Rajiv. It's wild to me that he's won three in a row, but he and I played in the US Open 2001 and 2002. And he's winning it in 2023, which <laughs> blows my mind. But uh, but yeah, that was cool. So that was kind of, you know, a very, very brief history of, of where I went. But I always had a little more success in doubles for sure. Okay. And then what about now? It sounds like you're spending a lot of time coaching juniors. Yeah. Uh, been, the last couple of years in Charleston, I left Duke in 2020 as a coach. So I was there for 10 years coaching the men's team, came back. I've been coaching juniors in Charleston, South Carolina for the last three years. Uh, sadly it's part of the deal, but all my top players, they've graduated, gone to college this year. I lost four. I have a couple younger players in the pipeline, but I've also started to coach adults more, which, mm. uh, I was just telling Maribon yesterday. I, I love it. Adults yeah. are, the adults are always into it. Like as a coach, you want someone who's just dying to get better yeah. and dying to absorb knowledge and ask questions. And I have found every adult that I've been on court with is just like that. So yeah. Um, starting to coach adults more and I love it. Awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It depends on the coach, I guess, but, um, I, I think I'm a little bit more like you. It sounds like you're not as into trying to like be a motivator as you are like just coaching the tennis, you know? Yeah, for sure. So one thing I always, <laughs> whether it's right or wrong, I tell players like, look, I number one, have to motivate myself. Like I told you, it was cold today. So I got to give myself a pep talk. I'm going to go stand in the cold and the wind for eight hours. I got to plan the lesson. I've got to figure out how I'm going to communicate with you to get the idea across, right? Uh, if I'm also responsible for your attitude and your motivation, like what are you responsible for? Like, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm doing everything. You know, yeah. you've got to have at least <laughs> some job. And like, to me, your job is come out motivated, and willing to accept coaching. And then I will be busting my butt to give you the best coaching eight hours a day and every single person that I see. So yeah, I'm definitely not the type. I'm not the rah-rah guy. If you're looking for motivation, yeah. <laughs> you, you come to the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. Um, so you talked about college tennis. Uh, you coached at Duke for a while, obviously played um, very successfully in your college tennis career. What are some of the keys to winning in college tennis? Obviously, it's a lot different with the um, no ad uh, set to six. You know, mm -hmm. That's it. Um, what What are some of the keys to winning in college tennis? So specifically for there, that set to six, no ad, that's a sprint. I mean, yeah. I can't tell you if a match started at one o'clock on a Sunday. It could be 107 and you're down 3-0. Yeah. Like, geez, like how... <laughs> <laughs> what's going on where am i what's happening so you better be ready on the first point mm -hmm. um that that's number one i find that a lot of the things that we would do in college would apply to an amateur i mean you've got to make first serves if you're hitting second serves guys in college are teeing off on the ball and they'll miss mm -hmm. some but they're ripping the ball you just feel like you're on your back foot and you'll win some points but that's that you're not going to hold serve very often without a first serve so Mm -hmm. First serve percentage, super important. Obviously, I would say making first serve returns. I don't even care how. And mm -hmm. then attacking second serve returns. That That's a big thing. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing for college, especially, like we said, it's a sprint, but like insane energy. And this is one that I, I feel like people hear it and they go, oh, yeah, we've heard that, but we just want to serve better. Every doubles player I talk to, every pro I interview on the podcast, everything when by experience personally and then watching as a coach, you cannot be good without energy. Yeah. You can be you can be good with a bad serve. I've seen that. I've seen yeah. people win in doubles with no volleys. I have never seen someone successfully maintain a level in doubles with no energy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. but people that's not fun to work on though, right? So people don't work on it, but if it's me, I hear that and I go, man, I don't even have to have talent. I just got to go out and do that. I'm like, sign me up yeah. for that one. I can knock yeah. that one out of the park. So those those three things for sure in a college match. 
Yeah. You see a lot of the college teams working on it. Like I, I live near TCU and I'm over there sometimes practicing on their, um, the courts and like the men's or women's team will be like, even during practice, like saying, go frogs, let's go TC, you know, like kind of getting each other, um, it's, man- it's mandatory h- high energy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and you hear it during the matches, obviously, um, especially in doubles. I mean, every single point they're like, come on. It almost, sometimes it annoys me as a fan, but I get yeah. why they have to do it. Um, yeah. It's, it's fun to watch. Uh, so I, yeah, I was chatting actually with a recent, a, a coach um, recently about we we're looking at net positioning for, for some of these college players and for the college players, obviously doubles is only one point. So it's a little bit, you know, less important than singles for sure. So they can't spend as much time practicing doubles. Um, but we were looking at like net positioning and I was trying to teach them, you know, you want to be covering the middle. And, and he did make a good point that, you know, I was showing them pro level matches on the WTA tour and their volleys are better, right? Relative to the ground strokes. Whereas these college players volleys are, are much worse relative to their ground strokes. Um, does that change anything for you as far as, movement at the net or, or positioning not really i mean no. you, you you have to have some type of quality of shot so if i said hey i'm gonna mm-hmm. plug middle right and mm-hmm. you're serving 40 miles an hour okay I, that's not gonna go really well like someone's gonna smash the ball and that's really difficult so yeah if there's not a quality of shot for you to move off of that's fine but if you don't volley well mm-hmm. okay well to me, you have two options, and a lot of people don't agree with the second option. Option one is get close to the net, be in the middle, and be aggressive. Mm-hmm. And even if you can't volley, like you said, you can shank sometimes. You can have the baseline player across the net take their eye off the ball. There's lots of good things that can happen, and I've seen really good doubles players in college who I would say are not great volleyers. Mm-hmm. If you don't like your volleys, okay, well, if you're not going to close and put yourself in the middle of the action – Then you're at the net as a defensive volleyer. So what's harder, a defensive volley or an offensive? I would say a defensive volley is harder. So if you're going to be up there but not do anything, I would say, why are you up there? Mm -hmm. So we actually had a team at Duke. It was so funny, too. Um, We had a bunch of injuries, and they weren't the best servers, and they (laughs) they didn't have the best volleys. And I wasn't even trying to play mind games with them. I was just being pragmatic. And they had to play number three doubles together. And I said, listen, guys. You know, I know you guys don't like volleying. I know you don't like poaching. Our serves are not great. The only time I'm going to allow you to come to the net is to pick up a ball if you miss in the net. (laughs) So you're going to, you're going to serve and your partner's going to stand right next to you and you're going to feel like an idiot. You're going to feel weird. And when you return, your partner's just going to be standing next to you and you guys are just going to crank ground strokes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they got a little offended that I said their serves weren't good. So in practice, they started serving like 10 miles an hour faster, which was hilarious. (laughs) Like, I loved it. Like, they thought they were showing me. I'm like, this is awesome. I had no idea you had this. And then they would go in matches and they played two back on everything. And I believe they went nine and two in the ACC. Wow. And I'm like, okay, I would not really coach people to stand back, but I had watched them at the net and they didn't want to plug middle and they didn't Mm want to get close. Yeah. So wh- why be up there? You you can't go to the net to play defense. Mm-hmm. I just don't understand that logically. That just doesn't really make sense to me. So fine. You don't want to do those things. Let's go back and we can play offense from the backcourt. You guys can just tag forehands and feel good about yourselves. So I know a lot of people are like intuitively two back. A lot of coaches cringe at that. But if you have a net player who doesn't want to dig in and play offense, I don't see what the other option is. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've coached a few teams to do that. I've even done that myself on the with two back on the serve against very certain teams. Um, but in that case, like I do like being at the net, so I would just leave my partner at the baseline to rally, and I would serve and volley. Um, but uh, yeah, that sounds like it worked out. And yeah, I mean that that you, time you know, that time if, it worked out well. But like just <laughs> to, to go back to your original question, like would I? does that affect it whether it's a pro or you know a good a good college girl of course she can learn how to volley up there man yeah like that's not that you, you it's not like there's people who are can't volley or, or were born without the ability like you work on it 
And yeah. if you want to get good at it, you can get good pretty quickly and you'll gain confidence. And if you know where to be in doubles, that's half the battle. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, I, and that applies all the way down to the 4035. It's the same stuff. What do you make of uh, all the success on the doubles tour from college players? You, you talked about Rajiv, but it seems like more and more college players are having success. Um, we're seeing it in singles a little bit, but especially on the doubles tour. My best guess is, you know, a lot of people who come to college, they practice it more than someone who just goes pro at age 18, 19, and they're probably playing a majority of singles out there. And mm -hmm. they might play some doubles to pay for their hotel room, but it's not like they're practicing doubles. And then depending on the college you go to, some schools, uh, like Brian Calvis told me they do like 60% doubles of all the mm -hmm. time on court. Okay, well, that's you're going to be pretty good if that's what you're spending a lot of time on. And um, every co college coach has their own philosophy, but I would say, generally speaking, you're you're definitely practicing it more uh, than someone who didn't go to college. That's number mm -hmm. one. And then you're getting a doubles match every dual match. So you're at least getting 40 double sets a year. And it's a highly competitive, valuable point. So um, I think they just spend more time practicing it and learning mm -hmm. it for those four years versus you're a 19 year old Brazilian who's on the tour in South America. You're probably just grinding singles matches and singles points in practice. And then you got in doubles and you're like, I'm just going to smash forehands and hope yeah. I win a couple matches and make some bucks, you know? Right. Okay. So last question before we get to um, some more strategy for, for club players uh, you've been with working with juniors for a little bit. How much doubles are they playing in nowadays? Um, not very a lot. Little. Very little. <laughs> okay. I mean, when you're looking, you know, they have the what the L1, L2, all the way to L7. Yeah. The, the sc two scary things. Number one, I, I there's a certain level where they don't even offer it. So there's a lot of tournaments they go to. There's not even a doubles draw. Oh, um, I had one. I had one kid tell me he had never played a full third set before. Because when you go mm. to these L4s and L5s, it's always a 10 point breaker. And I was like, man, like, really? Like, the, when did that happen? Like, you yeah. never play like it's and he just plays 10 point breaker. So huh. uh, th those tournaments are are not great for doubles. When you get to the L1, you know, um, I was taking a girl to a lot of the top tournaments and, you know, she had doubles in every event. And you'll see a lot of great players who don't really know what they're doing. But that would make sense, because why would you practice doubles if you only have four doubles tournaments a year? You know, mm -hmm. th that really isn't a great use of your time if if that's what's happening. But um yeah, it's wild to me that there's a lot of these tournaments that don't even offer it. Interesting. Yeah, there's a big disconnect. We'll talk about it later. But um, yeah, it's just obviously so common at the adult level and the country clubs. And then you look at juniors and pro tour and it's just like not. Anyways, all right, let's move on to uh, serve strategy. So um. I kind of have a format here. You feel free to take it any direction you want. So I wanted to start. Um, I typically focus on strategy because I'm not very good at coaching technique, but I can tell through your Instagram channel and all your time coaching that you are. Um, what are one to three technical issues you see with the serve at the club level? And then also the drills or ways to fix them. Got it. So I would say the number one thing I see is the toss right off mm. the bat. So there's a lot of really high tosses. Um, and Vic, you go back to Vic Braden, everyone's kind of sharing online at this point, but a total game changer for me was realizing you only have to toss it a little higher than you can fully extend up for the ball. Right. And as a player, I used to toss high and I used to feel like it was normal, but if someone told me to throw a ball or throw my racket in a field, I'm not going to hesitate. I'm just going to be continuous, right? Mm -hmm. And so most people toss really high. I think Andy Fitzell said it really well. He said, people swing to their toss and you want to toss to your swing. Mm -hmm. So if you have a really good continuous motion, figure out the lower toss that's just higher than you can reach. So the ball is sitting there on a tee and that mm -hmm. makes it super easy to make clean contact. What I find at first, if someone tosses really high and we work on that on the court, is they feel very rushed and understandably so because they have less time at first and they're not yeah. used to it and they don't like that. And so they don't change. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if someone were to give you a really high overhead, they, they send a ball 100 feet in the air. You'd let that overhead bounce, right? Yeah. 
because it's almost impossible to time that in the sweet spot because it's dropping quickly. On a much smaller scale, that's what happens when you throw up a high toss. Mm -hmm. It's dropping quickly. It's tough to hit in the sweet spot. And there's a lot of technical issues that can come from waiting so long. Um, mm -hmm. The other big thing I would say, and this is a, a big one, I think the toss can be fixed relatively quickly. You know, you see a lot of people online talking about palm down versus palm up on the way back. And obviously, if you have your palm down, you have a your arm is a little more relaxed, you have a greater range of motion, you'll get more racket speed, you have the ability to hit it faster. That's a major change, though, for someone who starts like this. Like, okay. you don't you don't go to a lesson and go, hey, you want to work on palm down and leave the lesson serving well, you leave the lesson serving worse at first. Yeah. And if you're not willing to take 10 steps back to take 100 steps forward, it's going to be tough to improve that. So that's mm -hmm. a big one. If, if I go down like tomorrow, I, I coach at Snee Farm Country Club. If I watch 10 ladies serving, they're all going to have palm up. And mm -hmm. I don't know that I would necessarily coach them to fix that because I don't think they're going to go out and do 10,000 reps and learn how to get a palm down. So that's yeah. where we might focus a little more on the toss. Um, but those would be the two biggest things I see that mm -hmm. most people could improve on. How do we, um, I agree with you on the toss. I actually saw, uh, I don't remember if it was like on ESPN during the US Open or somebody did a breakdown online somewhere, but they were comparing Isner and Del Potro's serves. And, you know, Isner's slightly taller, but a significantly, you know, he's the best server of all time, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and Del Potro had a higher double fault percentage, um, had a lower first serve percentage, all this stuff, because his toss is so high. And mm -hmm. Isner tosses it just like you said. I mean, they did it in slow motion and it's just above his reach. And then it's not really moving when he makes contact with the ball, maybe moving down slightly, mm -hmm. um, which makes a ton of sense. But it, what are s some drills um, or ways we can kind of improve that on our own? So one one quick thing I'm going to say, and then I might forget, so you might have to ask me that question again. But okay. one, thing, one thing that's important is if you're watching pros – just because a pro does it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. Right. I mean, if, if you watched me at the U S open when I was 17 playing with Rajiv, I don't take my ground strokes back high and then let it drop. I just snapped my wrist straight down. Mm -hmm. Now I don't, it worked for me, but I don't think any coach would be like, Hey, why don't you go copy Stokey? That looks awesome. Yeah. That's not the ideal way to hit a backhand and a forehand. But I was in the U.S. Open at age 17, so does that make it the best way? No. Del Potro, insane player. Do I think his serve would be better if he tossed lower? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I know there are people out there who toss it high and like to toss it high and go, well, Delpo does it. Del Bonus right. does it. Sharapova does it. <laughs> and it's like, they do, but that doesn't, that doesn't make it right. So that's mm -hmm. a big thing. When you're watching pros, don't assume that they're all doing everything perfectly and efficiently. And then yeah. I totally forgot your question. So you are going to have to ask that again. Yeah. The, uh, ways to to fix the toss if, if we do toss it a little bit high. So the simplest way, uh, you can either put a ball in the fence or you can just reach up. But I go to the back fence. I take a, I stand right on the fence. Like I am mm -hmm. two inches from it with my chest. I take a small okay. step back. I take a small step to the left. And I reach up and lean against the fence. And I mark on the fence with my mind like, where is my racket touching? So for me, it's usually the very top of the fence. Mm -hmm. Okay. I stand right where I am and I try to toss and just have it lightly graze the fence. For me, it's right at the top for a shorter player to be a little lower exactly at that spot. So if my toss doesn't hit the fence, that means it's not into the court enough. I can see where it's going. Is it too low? Okay. That that's an issue. Or am I tossing a yard above where I can reach? And I just get to keep practicing reps and, and seeing a visual, like I'm actually aiming at something. It's not just empty space. Mm -hmm. Actually trying to hit a target for me is way easier. And then I'm getting okay. instant feedback every time. Oh, I tossed it two chain links above where I could reach. Okay, this time I tossed it four under. That's too low. This time I hit the fence really fast. That toss is going to go way too far in front. And you can just rep that out. And it's boring as hell. But you get instant <laughs> feedback and, and your toss will get better if you do that for sure. Okay. And are you, are you practicing these tosses with your racket in your hand? Yes. So, obviously not swinging. Yeah. Make it as real as I can. So I start in a ready position. I'll turn. 
I'll go up and then obviously I don't hit. So it's not perfectly the same. Yeah. What you want to do is, is as much as you can. Sometimes when I can be out there with a player, I'll just hold, flip my racket upside down. So I'm holding the grip in the air mm-hmm. and I will put the top of my grip where their toss should go. And I go try to have your toss just barely get above and then land on my grip so they can see an object. Obviously, mm-hmm. if you don't have a coach, that's something you can't do. But the fence one is a super easy one. Okay. That's a great tip. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, just kind of in general, how you teach first serve or second serve strategy. And then I want to get to formations as well. Mm-hmm. So just generally what I would say, oh, I mean, <laughs> it's a big topic. It is. I mean, with Dan Kiernan, and I just talked to him. I mean, with everything, it depends. So mm-hmm. What are your strengths as a server? You know, if if you have a horrendous second serve, then we need to take pace off your first serve and get a lot of those in because mm. you can't be playing with that. If you've got a great, like for me, if I could go back and coach myself, I would honestly almost hit two first serves. I had a great serve. I don't think I double fault that much. And then I'm playing with my first serve all the time. Like that's something mm. I would totally do. So you definitely want to play to your strengths. Um yeah, I mean, that that that's a really tough, like I said earlier, playing with a second serve is a recipe to lose. Mm-hmm. And I don't find many amateur three fives go, you know what I have is an incredible second serve. Yeah. It's usually, hey, I can make it, but it's slow. Or yeah. I hit it okay, but I double fault a lot. So that's just something we're going to want to avoid. And that's the problem. That's why I love when people work on their second serve, because if you feel like you have a good one, you are totally freed up on your first serve. Like I loved my second serve in college. So I'd go for a lot of aces. I'd serve 55 to 60%, which might be a little low, Mm -hmm. but I hit a lot of aces. I'd get a lot of unreturnables. And then my second serve was only like five, 10 miles an hour slower. So I didn't think it was that big of a detriment. So you kind of got to get a feel for what you, what you have. But generally speaking, most people have weak second serves, which means high first serve percentage is very important. Yeah. Yeah, one one thing I learned um, from Craig that um, is you know a little bit obvious, but uh, I'd never really thought about it before is is focusing on depth for the second serve. And I was actually having some ladies um, do that last week in that three O clinic, and you know you can see when um, at the club level, especially if if you do have a weak second serve when people kind of just pop it over the net because they're just trying to get it in and it lands super short in the service box, the serve team is immediately just on a crazy amount of defense. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas if they can hit that same serve, it doesn't have to have any more pace really, or, um, you know, be a significantly big serve, but if you can just get it to land deeper in the service box, the returner is going to have, a lot less trouble with it or a lot more trouble with it because they're hitting from further back in the court. And that gives your net player more time to react as well. Right. And I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here. Cause like, of course I'm not advocating for a lot of double faults. Like that's a really tough way to play. But if you said, okay, well you can tap your servant and almost never double fault, but they're mm-hmm. going to step up and rip balls at your partner and rip balls at you. If you're losing the point, you're losing the point. Does it really yeah. matter if you double faulted or if they crushed a forehand? Honestly, I'd probably rather double fault than get my partner killed and make them lose confidence and have them backing up. So there is a sweet spot there if you go mm-hmm. for a little more in your second serve. And, you know, if I knew as a college player that I was going to double fault once every game, once in a no ad game, but the other six points I was going to be on offense after my serve, I'd sign up for that. Yeah. As opposed to I'll never double fault, but I might be on offense only four out of the seven. I think that's a harder way to hold. So Mm -hmm. that's something for people to keep in mind. Again, I don't want people out there just banging two first serves and double faulting 20 times, but there is a fine blend there that you can work with. Sure. So what about formations? How do you think about um, using either I or Australian formation? Um, Is there any sort of philosophy that you teach? Uh, in terms of that. like when I would use it? Yeah, when to use it and, and how to execute it. Generally speaking, in college, we did mostly I. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I want, you know, why not? Why not get you in the middle of the court already so you don't have to move? You cause a little indecision for the returner. I don't see a whole lot of downside there. Um, I was just telling Mirbon, so one example of how we would choose formation. So we had a guy at Duke and he got a stress fracture in his right hand. He's right-handed. So that's mm -hmm. an issue. So yeah. he could only, he could only chip four hands, right? Mm -hmm. So when he would serve, we would do three formations to accomplish the exact same thing and hope that the returners couldn't figure out. Cause each returner maximum can only go against you 12 or 15 times in a set. No ad. Sure. You're only serving three games. So it's not that big a sample size. So what we would do is in the deuce court, we would go regular formation. We would have the net guy poach. So now one of two things would happen. Our net guy would get the ball, which is great. Or they would return down the line and my guy could hit a backhand, which he was healthy enough to do. Mm -hmm. We would go I formation and the guy at the net would go right every time. And mm -hmm. the same thing applied. The net guy's going to get the ball, or they went down the line, and my guy got a backhand. Or we would do Australian. And he's already on the right side of the court. So the yeah. net guy would get the ball, or my guy would get a backhand. So we would mix it up to accomplish the same thing. And just because it looked differently at the beginning, these opponents were like, oh, my God, you know, anything can happen. And we're like, we're going to run the same play. So yeah. That's what's yeah. going to happen. Like, we're doing the same thing, whether you're smart enough to figure it out or not. So yeah. just giving the different look can mess people up. And I find at the rec level, if I go to my country club, no one's going I and no one's going Australian. Mm -hmm. And it's it's low hanging fruit because if I was going to play you a game for a hundred dollars and I go, Will, I know the rules, but you don't. Like sign me up for that game. I'm going to do yeah. better. And if if I know how to play Australian and you've never played against Australian formation, it's a massive advantage for me. I know the right. angles to cover. I know where the ground strokes should go. I know what you're likely to do. And you're just out there winging it. And so why not learn I? Why not learn Australian? Because if you know how to do it and your opponent doesn't, you've already got an advantage whether you can hit the ball better or not. So mm -hmm. learn all three. We used to do I just because of that uncertainty. But all three formations have a place. Yeah, for sure. I, I You know, I, I think just because so many club players only use regular all the time that's also what tons of returners see all the time so then using the i or australian is like oh i've never seen this before so you're automatically going to get an advantage with that right. like you said well one um, thing you can also do you know let's say you're playing me and you still think i can volley well i don't know if you do or not but if we're playing a match and my partner's serving in the deuce and you're returning in the deuce Okay. And I'm going regular formation. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to hit your first return in the match? Cross court, probably. Oh, if I think you can't volley well. No, you think you think I can. You go, oh, Stokey, oh, you oh. should be pretty good. Oh, I'm Where definitely going cross court. That's yeah, what yeah. I would think. So number one, I always poach on the first point because I most people go cross court because it's a simple way to start a match. And if yeah. they think you're any good, they don't want to hit you. So I poach on the first point like almost every time. Yeah. But if I want you to return down the line, because I think your down the line return stinks, what if I go Australian to start? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go on your first return of the match now? You'll probably go down the line. You're like, I don't want to yeah. hit the Stokey. He's right there. So now mm -hmm. I'm telling you where I want you to return just by where I stand before the point. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing. If you if you find out, man, that guy, he can't return across court. Okay, use that to your advantage. Set up the formation to work off that information so you're forcing him to either return cross court, which he stinks at, or he's going down the line right to you for an easy volley. Yeah. Yeah. It makes, makes a lot of sense. It's um, yeah. Something that uh, I was teaching last week was, um, and I think I saw it in one of your Instagram videos, but was also to use these formations to, to play to your strengths. Um, and uh, you, you talked about it a little bit with the guy with the fractured hand, right? Like using mm -hmm. three different ways to get the same result. Um, so I think formations is something that really one of the reasons probably that people at the club level don't use it enough is I think it's just uncomfortable for them and they're like not sure where to stand or they've never done it before. They don't want to look weird. Um, but yeah, I think, kind of being comfortable with that discomfort is, is really important as well. Absolutely. Um, so let's dive into return strategy a little bit. Uh, do you have any 
favorite like drills or ways to practice returns? Uh, I feel like it's an under practiced um, skill, but obviously the the most important or second most important uh, shot in tennis. Yeah, I mean, are you saying technically or just like from a just we're going to go work on it, you know, tactically well, type thing? Well, let's start with technical mistakes that, that you see. The the biggest one, so obviously people can take big swings. I loved what you said earlier about starting in different positions. So I always wanted, I took one step forward, I split, and I would turn and hit. That's mm -hmm. my rhythm. I want to keep the same rhythm on a return. So when I played Isner in college, that meant I was standing six feet behind the baseline because mm -hmm. that thing's coming in hot. When yeah. I played James Wan, I actually, this is like so funny. I'll, I'll never forget this because I, for some reason, I thought it was so cool. I played him at clay courts and he had a very slow second serve. And I hit the return from inside the service box. <laughs> I had my feet inside. It was that slow of a serve. And I was standing so close that I was able to do it. I looked at my dad and I was like laughing. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. But, I, but I kept that same rhythm. Uh -huh. So his serve was so slow. I had to start like five feet behind the service line. I could take a step split turn rip same mm -hmm. same rhythm if isner's popping at 130 i'm six feet behind the baseline step split turn rip i don't have to go oh one time i have to wait forever and then one time i'm feeling rushed i like to keep that rhythm the same and so i always try to get just like you said people to adjust to the speed of the serve that's a very very simple one and obviously you're not taking a full swing like you would on a ground stroke unless the serve is really, really slow. Um, so that's a big one. In terms of like just practicing it, you know, like I said, returns in play are gold. So we'll do sometimes, um, you know, I'll give singles example just because it's a little simpler to visualize, but, yeah. you know, we might have the depth line between the service line and the baseline. Mm -hmm. We'll put a little line there so it's nine feet from the baseline. And we'll say, if you make the return period in the court, you stay the same. If you hit it past the depth line, you go up one. If you miss the return, you go back one. And you've got to get to 10 points. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, they might hit one deep and then they hit one in the court, but it's short. Okay, you're still at one. Okay, yeah. you hit one a yard deep. Oh, you're back to zero. Yeah. And it's pretty damn tough to get to 10. Your depth gets a little better and doubles. You maybe are moving that target more to the side T or exactly where you would want that return to go. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a fun way where Number one, you'll get a lot of returns. It's very challenging. And then you'll go, hey, making return is solid. Making return in my target is great. And then missing return is devastating because I yeah. did all that hard work to hit the target. And now I'm back back to where I started. Yeah. Yeah, I like um, I like the depth feature um, on that. And then we talked about second serves earlier, the depth. So I'll, um, I like to use the term good miss. Like if you're missing a return a foot behind the baseline, especially in singles, like that's a good miss um, versus missing it into the net or um, I don't know, just short, I guess. Uh, and then same thing with that second serve, right? Like I, I think you mentioned earlier, like if you're going to hit a pancake second serve and never double fault, but you're still going to lose the point, like what's the point of that? So if you can focus on that serve depth and maybe you have a double faults, a few double faults long, that's okay. That's a good miss because you're, right. you're slowly over time going to get more comfortable with that depth. Um, so I want to move on to volleys and then uh, one question about baseline strategy. So on your Instagram, there was a drill. You were working with a, a kind of beginner player and using the alley to keep the face of the racket towards the target. Talk about um, I guess explain that drill to the audience and how that helps. Um, and then if you have any other volley drills to share. Yeah, so she would put her right foot uh, on the single sideline. She's a right-handed mm -hmm. player, right? And so her racket would then be in the middle of the doubles alley. And I would just toss her a ball and see if she could hit it in a perfectly straight line into my doubles alley. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they get a visual for kind of, I'm tossing it to her. She's stepping forward and trying to hit it in a straight line. Generally speaking, people take the racket back all kinds of different ways, and then they have to swing to get the racket back in positions. So they're chopping down, they're swiping across. And if you're just thinking about it, let's say in the doubles alley example, I want to hit the ball in a straight line. Mm -hmm. would, would it not make sense to swing in a straight line? 
you know, you don't need to swing down. You don't need to swing to the left. You just swing straight. So basically when we turn, we try to get our strings right to the target. And then when they finish, I want their strings facing the target. And so one example I always give them is the player will usually feed me a ball and we'll have like a cone or a, a hopper and I'll hit the volley and I'll say, look at my strings and see where they end. And they're usually facing the hopper and I'll hit it at least half the time. I'm like, how could I go wrong? My strings were mm-hmm. always facing the target. Mm-hmm. It's it's pretty impossible to miss that. So the alley is a good visual for you. You have a straight target, you know, you're going in a straight line and you're getting instant feedback. So if you miss way left of the alley, you go, oh man, I'm swiping across to the left. Or if you miss the right of the alley, you're like, oh man, I'm inside. I'm either blocking it, but my strings are for sure directing the ball. So it's a great way to keep your strings on target for longer, which gives you bigger margin for error when you're hitting a volley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll I'll link to that video um, in the show notes for people listening and everything else we've talked about as well. Um, So another net play question, one of the common issues, and I even posted this on our Instagram today to figure out kind of what people struggle with. And I think I listed serve strategy, mental game and net play and net play. I I think what was winning last time I checked mental game was right there. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's say a like three, five player comes to you and says, I stink at the net. Uh, I don't have any confidence up there. You have one month. We'll say three days a week for two hours. What's your plan? Okay, they come up to me. They say, <laughs> I stink at the net, <laughs> and I have a month to get them better. Yep, a month. Six hours a week, roughly. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, I, I want to make sure, go, do you think you can get better in the month? Yes. And if, it, it, yeah, and if they say yes, I go, cool, okay, we can get to work. If they're like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know. I'm like, okay, well, there's not going to be a whole lot of drills where I can get rid of that doubt in four weeks. So you got to yeah. realize you can get better in four weeks couple things uh kelly jones gave me a great one okay and mm-hmm. I, at first i was like man this doesn't i i don't vibe with this and then i went and did it with some girls who didn't volley well it was gold so he said when you have someone who has low confidence and they don't volley well number one he does a volley balance drill which i actually have on instagram so they step okay. in they hit a volley they freeze they keep their feet exactly where they are and then they back up one step so he goes mm-hmm. i just want great balance to start it's not, he's not even worried about the technique. And then number two is he instructs them to hit every volley cross court. It's a much yeah. easier volley to hit. And then they don't have to think, oh, am I going to go drop volley here in doubles? Am I going to go just hit everything cross? Mm-hmm. And so because they don't have to think, because it's very simple, and because it's also the easiest volley, you start to gain confidence. And then as you move along, and once you kind of go, oh, here are maybe some technical things, you're already starting to think you're on your way. You know, if you start trying to teach them everything in doubles and they're, Hey, there's a drop volley here and an angle volley here. That's yeah. so overwhelming. So that balance drill is huge. Um, strings to the target would be the only technical thing. And then I'd say we can do a little bit of doubles positioning, whatever, but let's just volley cross court. Mm-hmm. Let's just for now, for the first month, let's just get good at that. It won't be perfect all the time. Sometimes down the line is a better play. We'll worry about that in six months. I'll yeah. teach you that. But that that to me, like I did it with a couple of my high school girls. And like after a month, like they started to like volley. And mm. they're like, man, I'm pretty good at it. And at first <laughs> yeah. I was like, Kelly, really every volley cross court, but it was great. Yeah. Yeah. So w- when you say cross court, you mean like across your body? Correct. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. That's that's something I'm a huge proponent of. Um, I yeah. think it makes, yeah, it definitely makes it much easier. And Often, even when the angle's not there, it actually is there um, if you're close enough to the net, especially. Right. And um, you can still, you can hit a a drop shot cross court. You can hit a mm-hmm. fast angle cross court. You can hit it cross yeah. court, but slightly through the middle. Like you still yeah. have some variety there if you want it, uh, but yeah. you're still going across your body and you can gain confidence and it's an easier shot. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. H- how do we beat... Uh, or how do you recommend doubles teams handle the lob or beat teams that that push? I know you knew this question was coming. <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, I, I'm just getting exposed to it now that I'm starting with adults and like, that's the common thing. And yeah, 
like okay first of all you go i don't like playing lobbers i go sounds like you don't have a great overhead yeah like that's that's number one like i i would love to play lobbers that's the easiest way i could personally win a doubles match because i love my overhead that's great so yeah. number one acknowledge you probably don't have a great overhead and you should go mm -hmm. work on that a ton because mm -hmm. i promise you if you hit great overheads they will stop lobbing right yeah. um outside of that like you can go back you can lob off of their lob that's an option i know people view it like i used to lob all the time chip lob was like one of my favorite somehow it's been viewed as like not a real shot somehow i think the lob is an incredible play but yeah if someone hits a good lob to me and i'm on the baseline i'll just lob you back and yeah. see if you can hit a shorter one and then hopefully my net player likes their overhead or i can step up and rip obviously any type of drop volley or short slice if you can hit that at some point in the rally will make a lob more difficult to hit mm -hmm. um but i think the first thing is just realizing like man i hate that they do this I guarantee they're not lobbing it in the back four feet of the court every time. Mm -hmm. So one thing Rajiv, I asked Rajiv actually two days ago, I said, what is the biggest difference between you and an amateur? And he said, when people lob me, the point's over. Yeah. When people lob, when people lob amateurs, not only is the point not over, what well, it probably is over just in the wrong direction. Yeah. And he <laughs> said, I don't see people practice overheads ever. And he practices them all the time. Yeah. So uh, step one is get a good getting a good overhead solves that problem and i know people want to feel like i there'd be great if i can tactically just stop people from lobbing but i can promise you if i played you <laughs> I, I lobbed unc one time their coach told me 40 times in a pro set yeah do the math on that that's like three times a game and like i'm at the net sometimes like that's a lot so if someone's gonna lob they're gonna keep doing it the way to shut them up is to hit that overhead well yeah yeah that's the most obvious and I think the best answer. Um, yeah, people definitely should be working on those more. Um, and then, you know, work on some of those other things like the the chip shot to bring them forward. Um, different things like that can work I, as well. I just think also it's not it's not your opponent's responsibility to make you happy. Yeah. And to, and, and to, and to play to your strengths. If anything, it's their responsibility to make you unhappy. <laughs> Correct. So, oh, God, and I'm so annoyed. Like, oh, I hate playing that guy. Like he always loves me. Yeah. It's because he's doing something you don't like. And by yeah. the way, that doesn't make him a bad person or like that makes him smart. Yeah. You know? It's wor like, working. Yeah. He, he's not out there to groove you and make you feel good and play the exact style of tennis that you like. And if that's yeah. what you're looking for, then you find a friend who plays the same way and you guys go out on the weekend and you play and it's a blast. But yeah. if you're playing a competitive match, their job is to make you feel that way. Yeah. So, and I think it is like, even on the pro tour, I do think the lobs kind of, I, I don't know if it went away, but I, maybe it's fair to say it's like making a comeback. Um, Rajiv uses it a lot on returns, mm -hmm. um, especially against the I formation. Um, you, you'll see a lot of pro players use it. And then in the women's game, I mean, the more I, I study the WTA um, doubles players, I'm just so impressed with their ability to neutralize a point off of a huge ground stroke that lands within a foot of the baseline with a an immediate lob mm -hmm. um Ju juliana almost is fantastic she's probably the best at it elisa mertens is good at it um they'll just get this huge heavy forehand that la lands within a foot of the baseline and then just whip it up for a lob that also lands within a foot of the baseline on the other side and it mm -hmm. just totally takes out the net player. It's a really, really impressive shot. Yeah, there's there's no right way to play tennis. Some people yeah. view lobbings, oh, that person's a pusher. Oh, like like somehow that's, how is hitting faster a more honorable way to play tennis? And by yeah. the way, the people, what no, nobody really goes, I hate playing that person. They hit so fast, right? Like, yeah. That doesn't happen as much as, oh my God, I got to play the pusher. Right. If you think about it logically, like, why would you want someone to hurt you? Like the pusher is not trying to do anything. They're just trying to make balls. So you go, you know what I want to yeah. do? I want to go in the match. And I want to make sure my opponent hurts me. Yeah. And if you go, well, why is that actually? It's because they suck at it and they're going to miss. Yeah. The reason why you don't like a pusher is because they're not going to beat themselves and it's really tough to beat them. Mm -hmm. And so you don't like that. And yeah, yeah it makes no logical sense I, I don't like playing someone who really doesn't want to hurt me like that that just doesn't add up for me but, but. yeah i think i think that's the first step is the the kind of mentality and then step two work on those uh work on those overheads
Yeah. Um, so Jonathan, uh, we've been on for a while. So a couple of rapid fire questions, and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, what is your favorite tennis book? Ooh, great question. I'll give you one that probably people haven't heard. It's, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's definitely unique. A book called analyzing Wimbledon. Okay. Have you heard of this one? No, so it, it tested. I'm a big data guy. It tested like 15. I don't know what the plural of hypothesis is. Hypothesi. I, I have no idea. But yeah. <laughs> 15 things they tested uh, from like 20 years at Wimbledon data. So like hypotheses, uh, I think hypotheses. That's what we're going right? to go with then. Yeah, I think I, that's it. I got no clue. <laughs> but, but so one of them would be like, for example, uh, do big players raise their level? Do the best players raise their level on big points? And they would go through this, the stats and go, hey, did, does it all play better at, you know, break point? And basically they found, no, they don't. It's just mm -hmm. lower players play worse. Their level mm -hmm. goes down. The best players stay the same. If you could raise your level on a break point, you would have raised it before. Like, you can't raise your level on command. But the best players stayed steady. Or one of them was like, were you more likely to get broken after you had a break point the game before but didn't get it? And I believe on the men's side, it was like, no, basically no effect. And on the women's side, it was like somewhat significantly, they'd get broken more. Interesting. And so it tested things like this using data. Um, I can't remember all 15, but again, the way my brain works with information and also those kind of topics were interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a really cool one. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to have to read that. That, um, Yeah, there's something... Uh, a guy named Jeff Sackman, who runs a blog called Tennis Abstract, mm -hmm. uh, he did a study on tiebreakers, I believe, and basically the conclusion, you know, the, the all the TV commentators for a while were like, oh, you don't want to go into a tiebreaker with John Isner. And I was always like, why? why? You're still playing. The rules are the same. Like, you're still playing points of tennis. So, like, why is he better in a tiebreaker than not? And what happened was he actually just had like this 18 month stretch where he was really good in tiebreakers. Um, mm -hmm. But he looked at it over like a five year period and it was like, no, he actually wins about the same percentage of points in tiebreakers as he does during like a one all game or whatever else. Um, right. So I think the conclusion was kind of that pressure seems to affect everyone similarly um, but it sounds like the lower ranked players, maybe it did affect more in this Wimbledon analysis. Yeah. So basically, like, um, if, if you just think about it, like, let's say I'm playing the doll and I've got break point and I'm like, man, I don't know how many I'm going to get. There's a chance I'm either going to play really tentatively, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, this is one, my one chance. I don't want to screw it up. Or I might overplay and go, man, mm -hmm. I, I got a second serve. I got to take a cut. Like, this is my chance, right? The better players just play the point correctly. Yeah. Oh, I lost, okay. Well, I'm not supposed to win them all. Just, they just play each point individually, and the mm. lower players either overreact or underreact. And the best players just go, "Here's another point. I'm playing it the right way. I'm going to play this way for five sets, and I'll turn out okay." And that's something I've used with my players a lot: is just play the situation. You know, play the point the correct way. Play relaxed. You don't have to do more. You don't have to do less. Your normal strategy is already the optimal strategy. Mm -hmm. just relax and go go try to execute and then you'll play another point after interesting yeah and i, I guess for nadal like he, he doesn't really have to take the same level of risk right like the lower ranked player to beat nadal like you're gonna have to play really good that day you probably can't play like average and beat him um so one so way maybe, I heard it, one, one way I heard it explained. I know you said rapid fire questions. And now we're talking about this for like fifteen. No, no, minutes, no. But, this is a good topic. Like but, but, but uh, there, there was a golf guy that I follow. Actually, I'm gonna in, I'm gonna interview him for my podcast because there's a lot of tennis and golf, whatever. But he said he doesn't believe in the terms aggressive and conservative. He just believes in the term optimal. Mm -hmm. My strategy is optimal. So Nadal on a break point down. Okay, let's say he gets a he gets a good serve and he gets a short forehand. Don't you think he's going to come up and attack? Yeah, I would. I would not call that aggressive. That's just the op. It's just the correct play. You don't go up to that short ball and push it in. Mm -hmm. And if the if Novak hits an incredible return on break point, Nadal's going to back up and hit eight feet over the net. Yeah. I also wouldn't call that conservative. That's just the correct play given the ball he received. Mm -hmm. And so you just choose the optimal 
strategy. Aggre- I guess aggressive could be, wow, uh, Novak hit it three feet from the baseline and it all just took it off the rise and tried to slap a winner. Okay, I, I guess that's over aggressive, but it's certainly not the optimal play. And so yeah. I just love that way. Like y- you might hit a winner mm-hmm. on a break point, but that's because you got a short ball and it was the right time to go for it. And you might play a very passive break point because they hit three really good balls to you. Just play the correct way, given the ball you receive and see what happens. Interesting. I guess you could think about it like on different scales too, right? Like you don't want to play the same ball the same way every time because then your opponents, you're going to become predictable. So like optimal for the match might be, you know, call a poach on 30% of the points, which might be considered aggressive points, but you're really playing like optimal for your strategy for the match. And like that given point is aggressive and some of your points you're going to play conservative and overall, okay, we could talk about this forever. Yeah. No, I, I love that. But the way he explained that to me makes total sense in my brain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to check those out. Uh, what's your favorite tournament? Mm. I'd say U.S. Open. I mean, two years I got to play there. That's cool memories yeah. as a teenager. New York's awesome. Um, you know, when you go there, especially being from the U.S., you know, you see – you're walking around at night you see like a hundred people you know on the streets you go inside yeah. the building you see so many people I, I saw some guy he said hey to me like I, I i should know him i played him in the 12s that's the last time i saw him he's like stokey what's yeah. up man and i'm like what you know remind me again <laughs> i'm like oh my god like that was literally 25 years ago but seeing people the the atmosphere is awesome obviously it's a slam if i'm going to be a total homer you got the background pick there's a charleston 500 uh right down the road from me 10 minutes away the best women in the world come you can just park on the side of the street walk right in it's like the most accessible tournament yeah Um, but i love going to the open in new york yeah yeah both both great tournaments yeah the charleston one um yeah of the like the non-slams and masters 1000s it's probably i feel like the most just generally well-run tournament um bob moran does such a good job there the fan experience and the grounds is so amazing. Um, and then as a media, um, it was fantastic as well. So I really want to highlight that one. Yeah. Um, last question for you. How do we make doubles more popular? Uh, you mean on TV or like people playing it? Cause obviously everyone plays it. Yeah. So, I mean, you talked earlier about the juniors aren't really playing it much. Um, I do feel like, I think they changed, didn't they change the rules in college within the last like 10 or 15 years to make it less? um, uh, Did it used to be worth three points or maybe they used to play like an eight game pro set or something? It used to be be a pro set with ad. Okay. They took it down to a single set with no ad. With no ad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing is like people love, like honestly in college at Duke, we'd get so many people to come out for doubles and then they'd leave before singles. They love doubles. Oh, high energy, all these fun shots, whatever. And then, yeah. you know, you're, you're in clinic today and the kids are doing singles drills and like, Hey, can we play speed double? You know, can we get this doubles drill? We that's fun for us. Right. They like playing yeah. that adults like playing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you got to showcase it more. I think you got to find opportunities. I love it's an Indian Wells where a lot of the singles players play. Yeah. I think that's part yeah. of it is is they don't know the personalities as much. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody likes playing it. And if you get in a good match with good energy, they also love watching it from my experience. Last year at the Open, I basically only watched doubles. Mm-hmm. And I thought the crowds were super into it. Yeah, um, they were. Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure you asked that question. I I should have known that that question was coming, but... <laughs> no, 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 you're good. It, it, it's, it's a tough question, but everybody plays it. I think doing a better job of highlighting the personalities. Like why, if you say, well, all these doubles matches look the same, there's a lot of singles matches that look the same too. You know, mm-hmm. like it's not, it's not like there's like 18 different tactics out there for singles. So I think just doing a better job of highlighting the personalities, the backstories, the rivalries, how things yeah. happen. But I mean, generally speaking, people love to play it. So yeah. you just got to give a little more narrative and a little more character to these these great players. And I think it'll catch on a little more. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, Indian Wells is kind of the proof of that. Uh, as well as like, 
you know, on the on the women's side, at least you'll see it more. But like Coco Golf and Jessica Pagula played doubles most of the year um, and got really big crowds for their doubles matches because people don't care if they watch Coco Golf play singles or doubles. They just want to watch Coco Golf. Right. Um, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who actually do say like, oh, I, I prefer watching her play doubles because um, they just think doubles is more fun to watch. And right. I'm and on, you can on relate board to it, with cause... that. <laughs> right, you can relate to it because you play it more. Most people play a majority of doubles, so yeah. I want to see what Coco does and what she struggles with. And yeah, yeah. But I think if you knew the stories and if you said, "Oh, like man, Ram and uh, Salisbury, they got this big rivalry with this other doubles team." Yeah, okay. well, you already know Sinner and Alcaraz and these guys have rivalries, but who is Rajiv Ram's rival in doubles? Like we don't do a good enough good enough job of pushing that out there and explaining the dynamic. And um, yeah, I think that would yeah. help. Yeah, definitely so. Awesome. Uh, any final request of the audience or uh, um, any comments before we hop off here? Uh, no, just be willing to challenge yourself and be open to learning something new. If you're not good at the net, I promise you, everybody out there can be a good baller. If you don't know how to play Australian, I guarantee you can learn how to do it. Like step one is be open to improving and realize that you are not unique. You are not like this one person who's incapable of it everyone out there can get better you have to believe it and then you can kind of take the first steps on that journey but um yeah everyone can improve doubles is a great game and you know if i could ever help out with anyone you know i'd love to do it awesome well thank you again jonathan um and to everyone listening we'll link to all of this in the show notes including uh jonathan's instagram which you should definitely follow it is um one of the best tennis instagrams accounts uh out there um so thanks again jonathan and uh, hopefully we'll do a round two at some point appreciate it man love being here if you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches then join the tennis tribe double strategy newsletter every single thursday i'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match and when you join you're going to get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will, I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe, and over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players, all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays, with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So. To sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.